This switch has two 400 gigabit ethernet ports, two 200 gigabit ethernet ports, eight 50 gigabit ethernet ports, and even 10 gigabit ports for management. It's relatively quiet and sips power. Plus the pricing on it new is absolutely fabulous. So guys, we have a ton to get into today. So let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is the Microtik CRS812 DDQ. And by the way, if you wanna see the real model number on it, it's the CRS812 8DS 2DQ 2DDQ RM. Now even Microtik is starting to shorten its names because it's saying like, hey, they're getting a little bit long and complex. And for this switch, they I think actually had to go and add a couple of new uh, naming conventions just because this is a brand new 400 gigabit ethernet switch from Microtik, and it's frankly unlike anything else that we see in the market. And guys, if you've never used 400 gigabit ethernet before, it is so much more complex. That's why we have all of this network stuff next to me because I'm gonna explain why 400 gig ethernet is just, you know, you're gonna have to pay a lot more attention to how you connect it than you have in previous generations. And guys, when I first saw the switch, all I could think about was this is the perfect switch if you wanna go and have a little scale out AI cluster with the new NVIDIA GB10 devices like the DGX Spark, the Dell Pro Max with GB10 and all of those types of systems. And guys, we're gonna go into a lot here, but I'd love to hear what you guys think in the comments. Also, if you wanna learn more about some networking topics, let us know down below. With that, let's get to the hardware. Starting with the front of the switch, you'll see that we have two QSFP 56 DD ports. Now, these are important because not all 400 gigabit ethernet comes in QSFP 56 DD. We have a whole bunch of stuff and we're gonna go talk about that in our key lessons learned. If you don't know about how 400 gig networking works, please watch that section. Even if you don't watch the rest of the video, that is a super important concept and there's a whole bunch of things you have to learn to be able to go up into the 400 and 800 gig generations. Next, you also have two 200 gigabit ethernet ports. These are also QSFP56 ports. So a pair of those gives us another 400 gigabits of networking. Now, next to that, we have these eight ports over here, which are our SFP56 ports. The SFP56 ports are our 50 gigabit ethernet ports. They look a lot like an SFP plus or an SFP28 port, but with SFP56, we have our higher speed PAM4 signaling at 56 gig. So we get 50 gig networking out of it. And that's just, uh, you know, how the switch is set up. If you don't know about PAM4, just wait until we get to that a little bit later. Next, because inside we're using a relatively modern processor, we also get 10 gig networking for things like our out of band management boot ports, all that kind of stuff. And then we also get a console port. If you manage to lock yourself out, which is definitely possible, you have a little reset here and you can reset the switch, which is always nice. So let's get to the back of the switch and you're gonna see that we have essentially two things, right? We have a set of fans and these are hot swap fan modules. So if you do uh, need to ever replace one of these fan modules, you can. These power supplies are 250 watt units which is very big because two reasons. One, they're redundant. So if you have one fail or you have a power rail failure in the data center or whatever, you do have the ability to run off of the other power rail. The other thing is that they're only 250 watts. So if you were to look at a larger switch, you'll easily see that they have 1.5 kilowatt and sometimes more in terms of each power supply. So you may have two 1.5 kilowatt power supplies in here. These are only 250 watts, which is probably less than a lot of folks desktop processors. Now let's get inside the switch to see how it works. Opening up the switch, you're going to notice that we have a Morvell switch chip, which is our big chip in here. And then we also have a smaller Annapurna Labs arm chip. So the big thing here, of course, is the fact that Microtik is using Morvell switch chips. Now, Broadcom, of course, is the 800 pound gorilla in the networking space. But on the other hand, Morvell has definitely uh, not just data center switches, but they also do hyperscale switches. And we've looked at those before and they go to much faster than what we have here. They do like 51.2 terabit per second switches. The other thing, though, is that we get an Annapurna Labs arm chip. Now that Annapurna Labs ARM chip, if you don't know this, Annapurna Labs is now part of Amazon. So it was purchased uh, many, many years ago to go make internal chips for Amazon for AWS. And so the ARM chip that's in here has things like our 10 gig networking. And that really gives us the overall just awesome switch design. This is definitely not a switch design, which is like, what's the lowest cost we can do this switch at, right? This is really more about how can we do this switch well? And that's what I like about it. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the power consumption, but also the software and how you even manage all these things, right? Now, if you don't know this, Microtik has a number of different ways that you can manage the switches. For example, you can manage it using Winbox. You can use a CLI, which you can also access from Winbox, coincidentally. And then you also have a web management interface. If you log into the IP address of the switch, you can just log into it there and go and manage and do whatever you want. Why I mention this is because on this switch, it's a pretty easy GUI. There's a desktop application. There's a, you know, CLI if you want to do that for automation, but there's also another, you know, that web interface. So it's a very approachable management interface. Aside from that difference to other 400 gig switches, let's talk about another really important one. And that's the power consumption and noise. Now we're at about 34, 35 Watts with this thing booted up. We also have a 10 gig management port plugged in. We've also seen this thing run in the 28 to 29 Watt range when nothing is connected, we're not logged into it or anything like that, right? But that's really it. Idle, let's talk about what happens when you get to the maximum power consumption. Now, Microtik specs 81 watts as the maximum the switch can do if nothing's plugged in, but 134 watts if you have plugged in all the optics and what have you. Now guys, just the fact of the matter is 400 gig optics, they use more power than, you know, if you're using like a decent SFP28, 100 gig optic, it's gonna use way more than that. And it's just, that's life, right? And from a noise perspective, I have this on, it's running, you know, it has this 10 gig link on and all that kind of stuff in front of me. And frankly, it's uh, it's running sub 41 dBA right now. You know, this is a switch that, especially if you're using low power, like connections like DAX or what have you, uh, and, and you know, you're not using this thing at full speed all the time and doing everything on it, I actually think that this is a decent switch that you could put in an office pretty easily. It's not necessarily one that I would necessarily want directly next to my desk, but at the same time, it's also one that compared to something like that big Dell switch, absolutely any day I'd rather have this is somewhere near me because it is much quieter. Okay, so let me just show you what it looks like really quickly when it's all hooked up. Right here, you'll see that we have four ports that are connected. We have two 400 gig ports, which are going to our load generation machine. And then we have two 200 gig ports that are connected to our GB10 devices. Really quickly here, you're gonna see that we have two optics that are installed. And these are actually silicon photonics optics. You know, we have like a Cisco Inolite version here, but we also have another DR4 optic and that's what we're using to do that connection. So we can still use the MPO MPT12 or MTP12. Those optics are running in that 48 to 50 Celsius range, which is not too bad and it's perfectly reasonable. It does mean though that when we have these high powered optics that can be 10, 12 watts each, when we put those in, you are going to start hearing those fans because all of a sudden we've added 20 to 24 watts of extra components, which of course means that the system is, or the switch is going to pull more power. We're of course going to get more fan noise because it's also having to cool all of that. And just for a little bit of fun, I want to show you just a preview of something that we are going to be using more of going forward. This is Keysight Cyperf. It's definitely a well into the six figures. It took us like four months to set up six figures uh, for the license and stuff. So this is not a not an inexpensive tool. But one of the cool things is we were able to go and set up a test here where we're pushing some HTTP traffic as well as just some YouTube traffic. And even using that real world traffic, we're already at 335 gigabits per second. By the way, this is also uh, not only just real world traffic, this is also so not being tuned, so we're not playing with any of the transmission sizes or anything like that. It's literally just plugging in and we're already at 335 gigabits per second on real traffic. And in case you're wondering why this is gonna be so cool when we roll it out, we're also pushing over 930,000 HTTP requests over this uh, per second. And, and we're also running at about 390,000 connections per second. Now, of course, we're gonna have a lot more of this on the STH main site. And also over time, we're gonna be integrating this more into our reviews. So definitely check those out on the main site. But to me, the big things here at least are one, just by plugging in high-speed devices, you get just crazy speeds these days, even without doing tuning. And even though this is a low-cost switch, we're able to just plug things in and get relatively high performance out of the box, assuming, of course, that you've figured out all of your optics and DAX and stuff, because that's a huge component to this. Now, with all of these videos, I love to have key lessons learned. I mean, what do we learn by getting this giant switch in fact, even seeing it being built in Latvia, you can go check that video out as well. But like, what do we learn from this, right? Microtech is really designed to go and build high quality components for networks that are done at a relatively low cost compared to larger competitors. And that's, I think, exactly what this is. This is frankly a breakthrough product. But first I wanna talk a little bit about price and what are the coolest applications I think this switch is gonna be used for. So starting off, the list price of this device is around 
$1,295. Now, MicroTik list prices are different than a lot of other companies because usually there is a discount when you get to street price, especially, you know, maybe not necessarily when they're like first out, but if you give it a couple months or something like that, usually you get a decent discount off of list price. So this will most likely be still over $1,000, but it'll be under, you know, $1,300 would be my guess. Now, people will definitely say, this is so expensive, Patrick. I can't stand a MicroTik product that's over $1,000. But here's the deal, guys. This is a 1.6 terabit switch, which means it's like 1600 gigabits per second, which also means that this is less than $1 a gigabit per second. So on a dollar per gigabit per second basis, it would be like if you had a you know, one gigabit, eight port switch, and it was under $8, right? So let's just get a little bit real in terms of this is a higher capacity switch. And that means that we're going to be spending more money on it because it's just faster. Now, a lot of people are going to say, hey, Patrick, you can go get a used 400 gig, 32 port switch. It's much better because it has 32 ports of 400 gig ethernet. And here's an example, which is I think a Dell Z9332 FON or whatever the heck that this is. And guys, this thing is a 32 port 400 gig switch so it's definitely a higher capacity switch than what we have with MicroTik. on the other hand it's also usually about three thousand dollars used and the typical power consumption on something like this is gonna be like something 900 watts right so from an operational standpoint this thing is loud it uses a lot of power it's more expensive and if you don't have you know 30 plus devices or 20 devices or something like that you just need a couple devices that are high speed then this MicroTik is gonna be a much better solution, I think for most people. Let's get to something that's a little bit more exciting, which is what can you do with this? This uses a technology called QSFPDD. The basic idea is that there is an additional row of contacts beyond a QSFP adapter, which essentially gives you two times the number of electrical contacts. And so when we say QSFP56DD, for double density, where we're saying you know, the Q means quad. We have quad, so four, right? So think of that as like our four SFP 56 ports here. We have double density, which means we double that. And so if you see these eight SFP 56 ports that are each 50 gigabits per second, that's essentially what this 400 gig port is. It's eight lanes of 56 gig or 50 gig PAM4 modulation, which is different than the old NRZ that you would use in kind of older generations of networking. PAM4 is kind of like a QLC SSD where you can have four electrical states that you can read and you can say like, oh, okay, this is what this means versus just having like, you know, one or, you know, a single state that's either like one or zero, right? And so what that practically does is it means that you have to do a lot more filtering because you're trying to read between these four states. So it uses more processing power. But on the flip side, it means that you can encode more data. And that means that, you know, you can get faster wire speed. I know that was super high level and people are gonna be like, oh, but there's all this other complexity that you missed in that. But yeah, guys, we could do an entire video on that. We're just doing the quick version here. Now, the reason that I say QSFP56DD matters is that it's not the only 400 gig standard out there. For example, there's another standard, which is QSFP112. And that 112 means that instead of 56 gigabits per second, we have lanes that are 112 gig PAM4. And that means that we have essentially four lanes of 100 gig to get our 400 gig. And the reason that, that matters is that there are optics. Like this is a fairly inexpensive or relatively inexpensive 400 gig QSFP56 DD 400 gig optic. And it's a SR8, which means that we have eight channels of you know optical connectivity. Short SR means that we have short range, right? Which means we need 16 fibers. And that means that we can't use a MPO or MTP12 cable. We have to use a, you know, 16 cable. And that's how we get enough lanes to actually go and run an optic like this. So even down to the cabling that matters. Now, if you had the 112 QSFP 112, you might have like a SR4 optic because you have, you know, four channels of 100 gig. And practically that means that you can still use the MPO12 cable that you may already have out there. And QSFP 56DD and QSFP 112, they're not the only standards that you can have in 400 gig. In fact, it's actually common to not have those standards. So in my hands here, I have a ConnectX 7 NIC and a ConnectX 7 NIC. And the big difference between these is that this is an OSFP NIC. So we have a single 400 gig port 
OSFP. And this one has two QSFP ports. You can do like two 200 and then combine them into 400 if you want, right? And why this matters a ton is if you want to go from an OSFP 400 gig port to a QSFP 56 DD port, you better have the right optics in the middle because it can be completely painful. And I know a lot of folks are gonna be like, oh, who cares about the OSFP and all that? If you're using AI servers, by the way, they are super popular these days because Nvidia uses them so heavily. We have a large 800 gig switch that's all, you know, 64 ports of 800 gig uh, OSFP. So it's very common on the Nvidia side and Nvidia is just so big right now that it is a big standard in the industry, not just in Nvidia, but also some hyperscalers. And by the way, I have an assortment of other NICs from Broadcom as well as Nvidia over here. And these are the types of NICs that you would use to go and connect to the higher speed ports here. We also showed off a ConnectX 7 recently that has a four port SFP56, which would connect to, for example, these SFP56 ports. Now, let's get to why this is even cooler. And let's go over here to these. Now, these are the NVIDIA GB10. This is the NVIDIA DGX Spark. And then this is the Dell Pro Max with GB10. And so these are, I mean, honestly, these are gonna be, the, by the time this video comes out, right, these are gonna be like the hottest thing in AI. Each of these has a ConnectX 7, but they're QSFP, so they're not OSFP ports, which means that if we have a 200 gig networking here, we have 200 gig networking there, and we have this switch, we have a couple options. One of the reasons that you're gonna want this configuration right here, where you have a direct attached cable between these two systems, is because NVIDIA is going to, out of the box, support up to two systems with this DAC cable, single cable, that gives you the ability to do nickel and also to distribute models between the two systems. What that means is that instead of having a 128 gig, you know, one, one system, you can have two 128 gig systems, which lets you run 405 billion parameter models on a little setup that looks something like this. Now, of course, the reason that they're able to do that is because Nvidia is saying, hey, with these systems, we're gonna let you use nickel, we're gonna let you go and do all the cool stuff to go and really scale out models to different devices. And what Nvidia isn't doing, because I think they don't have a switch for it yet, um, was really supporting scale out to many of these. Now, one option if you want to have many of these is of course you go get a big giant switch and you go do that and I mean, you know, go hog wild and have dozens of these things and that'd be really cool and stuff. But another option is that instead of having a direct connection like this, you can instead use these 200 gig ports. And now you can see that we're running these ports all the way through the switch. Now, because this is using a decent Marvell switch chip, we have the ability to do things like run PFC and the features that you need to do RDMA networking over the switch. Now, I've also, I think there are, by the time, uh, you know, we're recording this a little bit early before these are out, right? So just wanna point that out here. But I did tell John Tolley, the CEO of Microtik, a couple of times when I was in Latvia, I said, hey, look, these things are coming out, and when these things come out, I mean, you guys 100% want to be able to support the RDMA networking that they need. Now, I'm guessing that they don't have units as early as we do, but at the same time, um, I'm very hopeful that they realize that this is a killer product. In fact, when I was doing the pre-brief call with NVIDIA for uh, for the DGX Spark here, I showed, literally brought this switch out on, on, the, on the call. I said like, hey, look, you could use this and scale this out to a bunch of them because not only can you do this configuration, which is pretty simple, but you can also use the 400 gig ports. So I mentioned that we had QSFP DD, double density, double the amount of electrical connections, but that essentially means that we have two 200 gig lanes that are going into our 400 gig port, which means that if we had a QSFP DD uh, port like this, we can plug in a 400 gig DAC on one side and then use our 200 gig connections on the other side here. And we don't need these other cables now, we can just go and go out of a single 400 gig port and connect two of these. You can have two on this port, two on the other 400 gig port, and then one more on each of the QSFP 56 ports. So that's six right there. And that doesn't even get to any of the SFP 56 ports, which could be used for things like storage, other servers, other networking, any of that kind of stuff can also be done off of there at 50 gigabits per second per port, right? So, I mean, guys, there is a ton. If you want to go and start building a scale up, let's say you want five units, for example, this switch on a relative scale, you know, you're going to spend $15,000 to get five of these units and you're going to want to network them, but you can just use inexpensive DACs a switch like this and you're set. And by the way, if you happen to see our recent video on the all flash NAS and wanted to know why we talked about it, not just for the studio, but for doing AI in the studio, 
this is it guys. And hey guys, I hope you like this look because this is just so cool, right? These are all systems and switches that as we're recording this aren't even out on the market yet, but are gonna be soon. And this is why I am so excited. It's also why we've been doing some things on the STH main site to prepare everyone for some of the concepts that we're using here. Like what are SR8 optics and all that stuff we're doing on the STH main site. And we're doing it with the foresight of like, hey, we know some really cool hardware is coming down the pike. So let's make sure that we have done the foundational concepts on STH so everybody can learn with us. So definitely check out the STH main site all the time because we always have really cool content there as well. If you didn't like this video though, well, why don't you share it with your friends and colleagues, but also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.